So let me uh, introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Andrew Gatchet from Northwestern University. Uh, Professor Gatchet uh, earned his PhD degree from uh, Stanford University in 2007. And after that, uh, he spent uh, three years in uh, NIST as a quarter. And after that, he moved to the University of Nevada uh, as an assistant professor, an associate professor. I first met him uh, there in the uh, Lino, when he was there. Uh, I think in 2018, uh, he moved to Northwestern University since then. Uh, he's working on different topics. Uh, his, his research interest includes the, like the uh, uh, table top experiment searching for the physics beyond the standard model or the detecting the uh, high sensitivity force or the gravitational wave. And he's also working on this uh, very beautiful experiment uh, called Ariadne, which is kind of uh, testing QCD axion uh, from uh, spin dependent interactions. He's a, a spokesperson and a leading this Ariadne collaboration. He also worked in the Ariadne collaboration since 2016 or 17. Today, uh, he's going to talk about the searching for PC solution with uh, this Ariadne experiment. Please welcome. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Yoon and Giannis, for the invitation to, to speak today. I Sorry I couldn't visit in person, but given the circumstances, uh, this is pretty good, I think, for, for the time being. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Ariadne experiment, which um, we're happy that folks there are also involved with this with this project, where the idea is to look for the QCD axion uh, using precision uh, NMR techniques. And uh, so I'm part of the Center for Fundamental Physics at Northwestern University, which was recently established where we have a bunch of, uh, a few faculty that are gathered together around a common theme of what we call tabletop uh, fundamental physics. So in addition to myself, I just wanted to uh, briefly mention uh, some of the other folks at the center. Uh, so we have uh, uh, Jerry Gabriels, uh, who is working on precision measurements of the electron magnetic moment and currently has the best measurement of the G minus two factor of the electron in the standard model. Uh, he also is involved with the world leading uh, group uh, which has established the best limits on the electron electric dipole moment. Uh, we have Brian Odom's group who's doing uh, spectroscopy of molecular ions looking for things like time variations in fundamental constants that may be related to things like dark matter. And we also have Tim Kovacci, who's doing precision atom interferometry work, uh, where he, his interests include gravitation as well as uh, dark matter. And so our lab uh, has a couple of different activities going on uh, in it. And so um, the, the theme that kind of unifies our activities together is that we tend to use uh, these resonant uh, sensor techniques uh, for looking for new, new physics. So uh, uh, kind of one half of my lab, which I won't really say anything about today at the talk today, has to deal with using high quality mechanical resonances, in particular uh, laser cooled and trapped nanoparticles where we're trying to do precision tests of things like gravity at short distance or also searches for gravitational waves at, at higher frequency than, for example, where LIGO uh, looks. Uh, we also do experiments that involve high quality spin resonances, in particular uh, NMR with laser polarized uh, gases. And this is going to be the subject of the, the seminar today where I'm going to tell you about the Ariadne experiment, where the idea is to look for a kind of fifth force uh, between objects that's a spin dependent uh, new interaction, which would be present uh, as a result of the QCD axion. So, um, there are many reasons, I think, to look for physics uh, beyond the standard model, but perhaps one of the biggest reasons uh, that we expect there's something beyond the standard model is, is dark matter. So uh, there's really quite an overwhelming abundance of, of evidence now that's coming from different types of uh, sources of data that suggest that 
there's a lot more uh, mass in the universe than can be accounted for by ordinary matter. And so, for example, if you look at galactic rotation curves, uh, for quite a while now, uh, we've been able to observe that it appears as though there's a lot more uh, uh, um, gra a lot more gravity than what you'd get from what we can account for with ordinary matter. There's also nice experiments uh, on gravitational lensing. This is the so-called uh, bullet cluster, which is regarded as one of the key pieces of evidence for the existence of dark matter. So here, what you're looking at is a clear separation of the area where there's gravitational lensing uh, from where the visible uh, matter is. So you have a galactic uh, cluster collision, basically, and there's sort of a separation now after the collision between the, uh, the, the matter that, that uh, is visible and the matter that's gravitating. And then beyond that, there's also a lot of cosmological uh, 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 data that suggests that there, there's dark matter, for example, structure formation and the cosmic microwave background. So uh, when you put all this together, it looks like our universe is made up mostly of things that, that are not ordinary uh, matter and norm, normal atoms. In particular, 95% uh, or so of the universe is made of what we call the dark sector, which is of some combination of dark energy and, and dark matter. Um, we have pretty good evidence that dark matter is there, but there's really no, uh, I, no, no evidence yet in terms of what it's actually, what it's actually made of. And so um, dark matter is a particularly difficult problem because uh, it, it could exist over a wide variety uh, of masses and, and, and forms. And so in particular, you can look at sort of the allowed range, say if you have dark matter that's made of some new, new fundamental particle, uh, what sort of masses that, that particle could have. And so you could look at sort of the scale uh, ranging uh, all the way uh, from kind of the Hubble scale to the Planck scale here. And so, um, so we know that dark matter uh, has to be heavier than about 10 to the minus 22 uh, electron volts or so, because uh, it has to fit inside the size of a, of a dwarf galaxy in order to account for the rotation curve of, of dwarf galaxies. And so we know dark matter has to be heavier than about 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, but it can be much, much heavier all the way uh, at the scale of at the standard model physics, electroweak scale, or even at the Planck scale, or even beyond that if you have composite objects, for example, things like primordial black holes and whatnot. So dark matter can kind of be split into sort of two two kind of categories depending on the energy scale. So, so if you have the, the mass greater than about one electron volt, you can have particle-like dark matter. And so this would be dark matter, for example, like the WIMPs, uh, which are being searched for in these large uh, xenon detectors. Below an electron volt, the, in order to get enough uh, uh, mass to, to explain dark matter, you need dark matter to be a, a boson. And so then what you can wind up having is like a field-like or a wave-like dark matter. And the axion is a particle that's, I think, one of the best motivated candidates for a type of this wave-like dark matter where its mass can range somewhere from 10 to the minus two electron volts down to about 10 to the minus 11 electron volts. Uh, sorry, was there a question? No. Okay. Okay, yes, no problem. Uh, so, uh, so the axion is a, in addition to being a nice candidate for wave-like dark matter, is also a, a very compelling particle to search for because it has a good reason to exist completely independent of dark matter. And so axions or axion-like particles are very generic uh, theoretically when you try to construct theories of physics beyond the standard model. And one axion in particular, the QCD axion or the Petri Quinn axion, uh, was postulated back in the 70s to solve the strong CP problem in, in, in the strong interactions, uh, which basically uh, would explain why uh, the neutron electrodipole moment is as small as, as we've so far constrained it to be. So ordinarily, you'd expect an angle parameter that we call theta QCD to be in the strong uh, interaction Lagrangian, and that the angle should naively expect it to be order one, but experimental bounds that we have now are constraining that angle to be uh, smaller than uh, one over 10 billion. And so, so if the axion uh, were to exist, you have a natural kind of dynamical mechanism which would drive this value of theta QCD to be such a small value and hence explain why uh, there apparently is very little CP violation in the strong interactions or equivalently why the neutron electrodipole moment is as small as uh, we've, we've measured. 
And so um, this, this solution to this puzzle combined with the fact that the axion can also be a great dark matter candidate really makes it one of the, in my view, most exciting particles to look for in terms of uh, physics beyond the standard model. And so there have been a number of experiments that have run over the past several decades, as well as several experiments that are being developed right now, and then new experiments that may be coming online soon to try to look for uh, axions as they would manifest themselves as a dark matter candidate. So the longest running experiment uh, that's been working in this community and also probably the one with the most results so far, of course, is the ADMX or the axion dark matter experiment. I understand you guys had a seminar from a, a, a visitor from this group uh, recently at, at, at your institute. So, um, so you're probably familiar with the, with the concept given that and the fact that several of you are, are there already working on axions. But the idea is you look for axion conversion into uh, axion couples to two photons. So if you have a magnetic field inside of a cavity, you can get a process where a real photon is produced inside the cavity and then you can read out the excess power that's deposited in the cavity if the wavelength, the Compton wavelength of the axion, which describes this frequency that the dark matter wave is oscillating at, if that matches the resonant frequency of the cavity, you get an enhancement of that uh, energy deposition process. And so you will get a peak in your power spectrum if you match the frequency of the cavity with the frequency of the axion uh, oscillation. And so the idea is you have a tuning rod in the cavity, you can scan the position of a tuning rod to basically vary the frequency that the cavity is resonant at. And in doing so, you can cover uh, axions in a, in a range, uh, in the case of ADMX, uh, within the range of about two to 40 uh, micro electron volts. So this is in frequencies that are a little bit below uh, gigahertz, uh, gigahertz uh, range. Uh, and so this, this is one style of experiment called the halo scope experiment where you're looking for basically a, ha a halo of, of dark matter converting uh, co cosmic axions into real uh, microwave photons inside of a cavity. But there's a, a different style of experiment one can do to look for the axion. So in addition to being this cosmic dark matter field which can produce photons uh, in a, in, 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 when you're in the presence of a magnetic background, you can also use the fact that the axion actually will generically uh, mediate uh, uh, forces between objects. And so in particular, one can produce uh, a spin dependent kind of fifth force uh, between objects that would be present at short distance uh, down where the range is basically set by the mass of the axion or the Compton wavelength of the axion that could be as small as say 30 microns, depending how heavy, how heavy the axion is. And so for searching for this kind of virtual axion exchange where the axion is now the, the the force carrier in your interaction. Here you have the ability to source the interaction locally and you're no longer uh, therefore dependent on any sort of cosmological assumptions about the evolution of the axion field or the presence of the local density of dark matter say at the earth if the, if the uh, axion was in fact uh, dark matter. So the experiment that we're involved with is called Ariadne which uh, stands for the axion resonant interaction detection experiment. Uh, it was named uh, Ariadne due to my uh, collaborator, when, uh, Azamina Arventaki, when we first came up with the idea. She uh, is a fan of Greek mythology, uh, being uh, Greek herself, and so, so we decided this was a, a perfect name here for for this uh, for this project. Uh, so right now is the collaboration between us at Northwestern. Uh, Mina at Perimeter, as well as folks at Stanford University, uh, Indiana University, uh, here at CAP, uh, Chris, as well as well as our most recent uh, addition, where we've now been joined by the group at the, the Metrology Institute in Germany, known as PTB, uh, where they've been able to also uh, um, help out joining our, our effort. So um, the Ariadne is uh, looking at uh, looking for axion uh, induced fifth forces essentially by, by, by using an NMR technique. But let me first tell you where in the axion parameter space uh, we're trying to target. So, so the axion uh, is, a, is a, a fairly um, uh, uh, well-defined uh, theoretical particle with, with a well-defined parameter space where the coupling constant of the axion is actually related to the mass. And so you can really just talk about the parameter space of the axion in terms of a single parameter, which is the mass of the axion. And so I'll just kind of take us through this, this plot here. This is basically showing 
uh, what the bounds are as well as um, uh, some hints uh, in terms of where the axion may live and for, for given, given, its, given its mass. And so the area first off in blue is what's been ruled out based on astrophysical bounds. And so in particular uh, things like supernova 1987 and white dwarf cooling uh, suggest that the axion must have a mass lighter than about 10 to the minus two electron volts. Um, and, uh, and now if we look further on the left end of the scale, uh, but still in terms of astrophysics, uh, depending on the model of cosmology, in particular, depending on uh, the energy scale of inflation, uh, there's also in certain models of uh, inflation, uh, there'd be too much uh, dark, there'd be too much uh, dark matter in the universe if the axion were lighter than about a few micro electron volts. And so in these models, then the allowed range for the axion would be somewhere between a few micro uh, electron volts and about 10 milli electron volts. But there are other cases of uh, cosmology. For example, if you have a low energy scale of inflation, then it's possible that the axion could still be dark matter and still have a much lighter, uh, a much lighter uh, mass. Uh, the, the, the boundary kind of comes down here from this black hole section. There's a process called black hole super radiance, uh, which can constrain the axion mass to be lighter than about 10 to minus 11 EV. So if you want it to be uh, agnostic with regard to cosmology, the allowed mass range of the axion goes from about 10 to the minus 11 electron volts up to about 10 to the minus two electron volts. And then, so now there, are, now let's go to the experiments. So the, the ADMX experiment, which was the first to put uh, um, constraints on the parameter space here, uh, is, is running at, at the range of kind of a few micro electron volts up to tens of micro electron volts in their next generation. They're, they're planning on extending that up here to, to tens, of, tens of micro electron volts. The, the CAST is a solar axion experiment uh, that's put some constraints around EV scale axions and its, its upgrade uh, YAXO, uh, which, which uh, is in, in um, being proposed now would extend this bounds over quite a bigger range here above about 10 to the minus two electron volts going all the way up to over, over kilo electron volt scale. Uh, CASPER is an experiment being developed that's also based on NMR that can search for kind of nano uh, EV type axions. Um, so let me zoom in a little bit on the central range, which is where most of the current experiments uh, have been uh, done. So, so this is kind of a zoom in of the region between about uh, a micro EV up to 100 micro EV. So here there's the ADMX result, which is this uh, shaded dark red area. There's been work from the, um, uh, high, it's high frequency cousin Haystack at Yale, uh, kind of at around 20, uh, uh, 20 uh, micro EV or so. And then of course, there's the exciting work going on right here at CAP, which is very recently reported, where now uh, there's some work in this in this range here also around uh, around 10 uh, micro EV. So there's a number of experiments now that are running in this band, which is pretty exciting as this as this parameter space becomes more and more uh, searched. So uh, at lower frequency, um, there are developing experiments that are based on kind of lumped element circuits. Uh, there's the dark matter radio and other kind of LC circuit based experiments. They're gonna try eventually to close this gap here for lighter mass axions between nano EV up to about micro EV. And then finally we get to where uh, Ariadne is intending to search, which is to kind of close in this gap here for heavier axions, uh, kind of taking over from where these cavity halo scope type experiments uh, and, and, and going up all the way to the bounds from the supernovas uh, at something like 10 to the minus two electron volts. I also wanted to mention there's a, there's a kind of open resonator style experiment, Mad Max, that's also uh, under development, which can also carve out some of the parameter space uh, in, this, in this higher mass axion area. So if I put all these experiments into context, I can sort of characterize uh, them by kind of the source as well as the coupling that they're searching for. So um, by, by a vast majority, uh, most of the experiments are looking for cosmic axions. So these are this halo, looking for the dark matter halo or halo scope type experiments where they're searching for the coupling to photons. So this is the category of ADMX, Haystack, uh, the dark matter radio, the, the work here at CAP, the, and the Mad Max experiment, for example. Um, 
the CASPER experiment is also a cosmic dark matter uh, axion experiment, but it's looking at the coupling of axion to nuclei. Uh, and then, so there's the, uh, there are experiments looking at solar axions. So this is CAS and YAXO. They're looking for the coupling of axions to photons. Uh, and then finally, we have experiments that look for lab produced axions. And so these are, in the case of photons, these uh, shining light through walls experiments where basically you look for converting a photon into an axion and then back into a photon in, in, a, separate, uh, in a separate cavity, for example. Uh, so th that's this style. These experiments are looking for uh, axion-like particles uh, that can be detected in, in this way. And then uh, last and, but not least, Ariadne is, a, is in this style of experiment. It's a lab-produced axion experiment in the sense that we're looking for virtual axion exchange where the axion is the force carrier, but we're looking for the coupling uh, to, to nucleons. Okay, and so the way this works is if I have two nuclei uh, interacting at some distance, there's generically two types of couplings that occur in the standard model, or in the, in the Lagrangian, I should say. And so one of those is the so-called so scalar coupling of the axion. And this is proportional to this angle, this QCD angle, theta QCD. So the, the term looks like the QCD uh, angle divided by the axion uh, coupling constant times some mass scale here of order 60 MeV kind of at the QCD energy scale. And then you have the axion and then two, two fermions. There's also a pseudoscalar coupling which couples to the gradient in the axion field. And it has this gamma five uh, term here which in the non-relativistic limit gives you an interaction essentially that looks like the gradient of the axion coupled into the spin sigma. So this is this where we get this spin dependent uh, type interaction. So in particular, you can have different kinds of vertices here where the axion is acting as a force mediator between two nuclei. And so in particular, we can get a monopole, a monopole uh, where I have, I have two scalar vertices. I can have a monopole dipole interaction where I have a scalar vertex and a pseudoscalar. And then I can have a dipole dipole vertex if I have two copies of this. Uh, of this uh, pseudoscalar vertex. So the Ariadne experiment is looking for this middle uh, variant where we're looking for the interaction between the scalar or, or the product rather of the scalar coupling and the dipole coupling to nuclei. And so if I look at the interaction potential for say the, the spin of one fermion sigma and the mass of another fermion MF at some distance, I can write down the potential due to this monopole dipole axion exchange. And so here I have the product of those coupling constants GS, GP. I have a term that goes like uh, one over the distance squared uh, here. At, I have the term, this exponential is giving me the range of the potential. So this is lambda A is the Compton wavelength of the axion. And then I have this sigma dot R. So this is the spin dependent uh, force. Or, or potential. And so because sigma is proportional to the magnetic moment of a particle, I can rewrite this as some fictitious or effective uh, magnetic field uh, where I, where I uh, just write this sigma as proportional to, to the moment mu of the particle. The range of the interaction here uh, is, is set by that, by that lambda. Um, so I wanna stress though that this type of interaction is uh, different than a regular magnetic field. You shouldn't be uh, confused by the, by the, it doesn't obey Maxwell's equations, it wouldn't be detected, say for example, with a, with a squid magnetometer. It doesn't couple to moving charges or angular momentum, uh, but, but what's, uh, so it's really just a fundamental interaction between the spin of the fermion itself. And what's very important experimentally for us is the fact that it's not affected or screened by magnetic shielding in the way that ordinary magnetic fields are. And so we, what we can arrange is a situation where Magnetic fields can be can be screened, whereas this axion uh, uh, magnetic field uh, is can can penetrate through a, a, a shield. As far as the the masses and ranges we expect, so given the astrophysical constraints for say axions that are lighter than about six uh, milli electron volts, then the natural length scale of this interaction is at the thirty micron uh, it scale or greater, uh, where where we have longer interactions for for lighter uh, axions. And so the way we want to detect this is using nuclear magnetic resonance. And so the idea in the cartoon version is imagine I have here a, a, a spin and a mass again, and this axion is producing this effective magnetic, uh, fictitious magnetic field between the two. Then if I take my nuclear spin and let's take a helium three spin one half nucleus, and I put it in an external magnetic field, 
I will get some energy splitting between the spin up and spin down uh, states of the nuclear spin, where the frequency here is set by, is, is, the, is the nuclear, uh, nuclear Lammer precession frequency given by twice the moment times the B field over, over H bar. And so if I now subject this, uh, this polarized nuclear uh, spin of the helium-3 uh, nucleus to my uh, uh, magnetic field, effective magnetic field from, the, from, the, uh, from this nearby mass, that I can arrange a situation where I oscillate the position of the mass at this nuclear alarm precession frequency. And so when I do that, I'm essentially modulating that, uh, the, a transverse magnetic field at the nuclear alarm precession frequency. And so this is, this is sort of like analogous to driving the, 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 um, the helium-3 nucleus with the magnetic field from a coil, but rather than using a real magnetic field from a coil, I'm using this fictitious magnetic field from the axion interaction itself. And so I arrange this resonant condition where then I, I bring the mass close and farther away at that precession frequency, and therefore uh, I can drive this transverse magnetization in the, in the nuclear spin, which we can then try to detect uh, using a, a squid magnetometer or another type of magnetometer. And so by using this resonant technique, we can get an amplitude that gets resonantly enhanced by an effective Q factor or quality factor, which is the product of the frequency and the, the T2 or the transverse uh, relaxation time in this nuclear spin, which can be quite large uh, in the case of nuclear spins in, in helium-3. And so the, the experimental concept looks a little bit more like this in practice. So what we have here is a, a vessel that contains uh, laser polarized uh, helium-3 gas. And this is gonna be the detector to measure the axion signal. And then nearby this uh, vessel with helium-3, we have a unpolarized uh, source mass. So this is made out of tungsten. So this is gonna give me this mass spin interaction. And so this source is this fictitious magnetic field. And so the, the sample area here, the sample volume is enclosed in a container which is coated with superconducting shielding. And so that superconducting shielding then will prevent uh, regular magnetic fields from penetrating through, but, but not prevent this axion-induced magnetic field from penetrating through. So the idea is that we take this source mass and we arrange it so that it, it has uh, in, in this gear shape and has these teeth. And so as we spin the, uh, these, this, this source mass cylinder, the teeth of the cylinder come by and, uh, and every time a tooth comes by, it basically modulates the strength of this effective magnetic field. And so we arrange the situation so that the teeth are passing by uh, at the nuclear alarm precession frequency so that we're resonantly driving uh, the spin precession, uh, which then can be picked up using a, a pickup loop uh, using a squid magnetometer that's being developed uh, by, by our collaborators here at, at CAP and uh, at CRIS in Korea. So the, uh, the, the fundamental limit of, of sensitivity of this experiment is going to be given by, by this, the transverse uh, quantum spin projection noise. And so this scales like one over the square root of the product of the volume, uh, the density, and this T2 time, this, this transverse decoherence time. And so, uh, so to, to get better sensitivity, then we want, we want high density, we want high, uh, high T2 time and, and as large volume as sample for, for the interaction length scale that, 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 that we're looking at. So our projected sensitivity uh, with this experiment is shown here in this plot. And so what I have on this, uh, on the scale here on the vertical axis, I have the, um, uh, um, this product of this coupling constants, uh, the scalar and dipole coupling constant. On the horizontal scale on the bottom, I have the range, this is the Compton wavelength of the axion. Or for those of you that prefer to look at the mass, on the top scale, I have that mass of the axion going from, from tens of uh, micro, tens of milli EV here down to micro EV here on the, on the upper right. So lighter mass axions to the right, heavier to the left. And so um, what currently has been ruled out now, according to experiment is shown in this shaded uh, blue band at the top. So these are precision uh, magnetometry experiments uh, primarily. Uh, if you were to take the results of these experiments and combine them with our best limits from astrophysics, then one can infer bounds that are uh, given by this shaded tan color band here, which is several orders of magnitude better uh, than this blue band. But 
still quite far from the, the gray band here at the bottom. And the gray band is where we would expect naturally the interaction from the QCD axion uh, to live. So the, the boundaries of the band, the upper boundary and lower boundary are determined from what we know about the, the angle, this angle theta QCD, which we've constrained from neutron EDM uh, measurements. And so we know theta QCD is less than about 10 to the minus 10. That kind of sets this upper band. But at the same time, we also know theta QCD should be bigger than about 10 to the minus 16. And this is because there's still a small amount of CP violation that we know is present in the standard model. And through higher order effects, one can, ex one can actually generate small amounts here uh, uh, where we'd expect to see theta QCD, if the axion were to exist, theta QCD should be bigger than about 10 to the minus 16. So there's about six orders of magnitude here in this potential parameter space from where we currently have constrained things from the neutron EDM and where we really would expect this to be if the axion were to exist at all. And so Ariadne, uh, depending on our initial T2 that we're able to get in, in our first round of, of our first implementation, is aiming to first to start to get into this parameter space for the first time for where the QCD axion uh, is predicted to be. Uh, assuming we, we can keep the experiment under control and understand our systematics, we, we may be able to develop an improved kind of scaled up version, which would allow us to cut basically this parameter space uh, into about half of what's, what's allowed, at least on this, on this log scale. And going forward, if we, if we could imagine using uh, techniques involving uh, a coherent or, or, or collective modes or, or squeezing or something like that, which would allow us to circumvent some of these limitations from, from spin projection noise, if we were only limited by, our, by our, our squid magnetometers that one could make, it may be possible to push this technique in the far future all the way down if in this to the squid limited reach area here, which would al amount to essentially uh, um, exhausting almost this entire uh, parameter space at this at this length scale. But so for the first uh, for the first experiment that we're doing to sort of test the principle, this is the the picture of the layout for the for our cryostat. So we have this uh, tungsten source mass rotor which is sitting on a shaft which rotates. And around it, we have three uh, sample chambers. So we use three different sample chambers so we can look for correlations in the, in, the, uh, in the signal so we can subtract out common mode and other kinds of other noise sources in the system. So this, this source mass is spinning uh, on, this, on this shaft that's connected to a motor. And then it, around, this, this, uh, uh, around this source mass, we have this, uh, these quartz blocks, which will be coated with niobium and gold. And the sample, the helium-3 sample is in sort of a flat pancake type configuration that's within a couple hundred microns of the surface of this spinning uh, tungsten rotor. And then we have a, a squid pickup uh, loop to pick up the magnetic field uh, that, that's um, generated by the, by, the, by the processing magnetization of the helium-3. So uh, our, our parameters of, that we're aiming for in the first round of the experiment is to have, we have this 11 segment a tungsten wheel. Uh, we have a, about a hundred hertz uh, target frequency for the nuclear alarm uh, precession frequency. So that means that this wheel is actually spinning at, at one eleventh of that frequency, or in other words, around nine hertz. Uh, we have a, a helium three density target of about two ten to the twenty one at, at, at four k, and then we have a volume for the initial sample chamber about three millimeters by one hundred fifty microns. Uh, where our mean separation distance is something like 200 microns for, for, this, for this round in order to look at axions in that kind of uh, milli-EV uh, sort of uh, mass range. So uh, to, to get a really highly polarized uh, sample is not necessarily trivial uh, for helium-3. And so you can't, for example, use uh, ordinary magnetic fields to get polarization that's near unity just because of the Boltzmann factor. And so uh, we use optical pumping techniques in particular. Uh, our colleagues at Indiana are, have some expertise in metastability exchange optical pumping. And so the idea here is you take uh, helium-3 gas and you can use RF discharge to excite it to some metastable state, uh, which then can be optically pumped using uh, 1083 nanometer light. And so then through collisions, you can wind up repolarizing the ground state uh, with near unity polarization. And so, so in, in a sort of tabletop version of their apparatus, they were able to get kind of 70% uh, polarization in the past in a relatively short time scale in the matter of only a, a few seconds. Uh, very recently, they've implemented a 
miniaturized version of that polarization setup on top of a, a cryostat a test assembly, where very recently now we've been able to show some first results on polarization, which is uh, already at sort of the 30% level at sort of the, at the first turning on level. And so we're, 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 we're optimistic we should be able to improve that, that polarization to, um, to closer to 50 to 70% like has been seen previously. But already this is, this is already very hyperpolarized compared to what one would be able to do using regular magnetic fields. And it's already at a level where, where the sensitivity in the experiment would begin to look pretty impressive. So um, this experiment has a number of uh, difficulties and challenges that one has to contend with. So I'm gonna spend some time now kind of going over some of the, the, the work we've been doing to kind of characterize different aspects of the, of the setup and the experiment to make sure that we're gonna be able to keep our uh, systematic effects and noise sources at a level which would allow us to get close to the sensitivity that we advertised in our, in our projections. And in particular, uh, these are just a list of some of the things we're worried about. I'm not gonna go through uh, the entire list in this talk. I just wanna highlight kind of three different things we've been working on in, in our group over the past uh, couple of years to start, try to make sure that things will work the way we the way we expect. In particular, I'll say a little bit about the problem that we'll we need to worry about with magnetic gradients in our in our in our sample chamber. I'll say something about the, the characterization of vibration that we've been working on, and then I'll talk about uh, uh, the characterization of our magnetic shielding as well as the magnetic uh, noise from backgrounds and impurities and things like that in our in our source mass uh, rotor that we've been uh, been able to prototype uh, so far. Okay, so so in order to measure this really really tiny uh, magnetic field from the axion, which is actually going to be at the level below an Atto Tesla, uh, we need to really make sure that regular magnetic fields uh, don't uh, don't drive our helium sample uh, at the same time, and so it's really essential to enclose the uh, sample volume in, inside of a superconducting shielded volume, and it. The reason for that is that we have to avoid uh, Johnson noise. So if we have ordinary materials, uh, we can have thermal motion of the uh, electrons in the material. And this can produce some spectrum of fluctuating magnetic fields uh, near, near the surface of materials, which can easily be at the level of say femtotesla, uh, perut hertz type, type noise uh, levels. And we're trying to get down to uh, sub tesla. And so right there, that, that requires the use of some kind of superconducting magnetic shield. And so superconducting shielding, it relies on the Meissner effect where basically you can't have flux crossing uh, a superconducting boundary. Uh, mathematically, it's kind of easy to understand and model if you use the, the method of images. So for example, if you have a dipole, magnetic dipole and you put it next to a superconducting boundary, you can create the, the equivalent boundary condition on, across the superconductor by imagining that there's an image dipole across on the other side of the boundary with the same direction of magnetization. And then if you look at the superposition of the magnetic fields from the original dipole and the image dipole, then you'll, you'll see that you actually satisfy the condition that there's no flux uh, across, across the boundary. And so in, in Ariadne, we'd like the magnetic field uh, in, the, in the sample volume to be homogeneous. And so the way we do that is by using a spherical or actually a spheroidal uh, shaped uh, geometry. And so inside of a uniformly magnetized sphere, the magnetic field is constant. And it turns out that if you take that sphere and you deform it into a ellipsoid or a spheroid, it also stays constant as long as the magnetization is uh, polarized along one of the principal axes of the, of the, um, of the ellipsoid. And so this gives us a constant magnetic field so that the entire sample can be driven on resonance with my spinning uh, mass uh, rotor. But uh, a complication comes up when I need to operate this uh, magnetic sensor right next to a superconducting boundary, uh, which is needed to screen magnetic noise. And so we call this the problem of unwanted images. So in the ordinary case, I can have a uniformly magnetized spheroid where all of the helium-3 is sitting in the same magnetic field and can all be driven coherently together on resonance with the spinning uh, tungsten wheel. But now as soon as I introduce this superconducting boundary, which needs to be very close by because I wanna measure short range axion forces, uh, there's now this uh, problem of this eff effective image spheroid, which one can think of on the other side of the superconducting boundary, which then creates its own magnetic field. The problem is that the magnetic field from that image spheroid is no longer 
completely constant or uniform across the original sample volume. And so now I've introduced a gradient in the magnetic field across the original sample, which will cause uh, inhomogeneous broadening, which will limit the, the sensitivity of the, of the NMR experiment. And so, so um, what we can do um, as a way of circumventing that is to, to create a, a flattening, a field flattening solution. So by implementing a, a, symmetri a symmetrically placed uh, current carrying coil, we can actually nullify uh, and essentially fill in the gradient, if you like, from that image spheroid. So we model basically the effect of the spheroid, its image, then the effect of the coil and its image, et cetera, inside of a superconducting volume. And so doing that, uh, we can actually arrange, uh, so if you compare the case of the uncompensated and the compensated case, we can actually improve the flatness by about a, a factor of, uh, pardon, 100 here uh, by, by just using this uh, uh, gradient cancellation coil, which should allow us to, to take advantage of these really high T two times in excess of 100 seconds or so. So, so that's one, one problem we have to contend with. Another problem is that we'd like the bias field, uh, which is the uh, helium-3 is sitting in, to, to match the, to, which basically sets the nuclear arm precession frequency. That bias field needs to be set to match the rotation rate of the, of the tungsten rotor. And so I need some way to apply a constant bias field. And so Ordinarily, one would use something like a Helmholtz coil to create a constant magnetic field, except again, we have to contend with the fact that this object is now sitting up against the superconducting boundary. And so the way we, we deal with that is to use a, a D-shaped coil. So rather than an ordinary Helmholtz coil, we pattern a coil that's in a D-shape. And so then if you consider the current in the, in the real coil as it's, as it's flowing right next to the superconducting boundary, one can analyze the situation as if there's an image current flowing on the opposite side of the boundary. And when you add up the, the currents from these two configurations, what winds up appearing is that it, it looks essentially like you had a single larger coil. So you can, you can kind of create a Helmholtz coil by using this D-shaped coil right up against the boundary. And then we've modeled that and then actually had seen, seen that you can, we expect to get a pretty, pretty flat field similar to a traditional uh, Helmholtz coil by, by using that approach. And so then um, in order to implement this in the experiment, our, our uh, quartz uh, block, which contains our, our helium-3 uh, sample, needs to have these, these, these current carrying coils patterned into it. And so we have the, the quartz block assembled in sections here where we have the, the spheroid, the sensing helium-3 chamber here. We have our compensation coil for the gradient cancellation as well as the current uh, coils for the um, for the setting the bias field uh, for the alarm precession frequency, all patterned into the same block. And so we've done some fabrication and, and polishing tests for fabricating these spherical cavities. We're trying to refine that. We just got our latest batch recently delivered a couple days ago, so we're excited to attempt constructing this, this quartz block uh, sometime soon um, and checking the performance. So um, this entire assembly, uh, of course, needs to be protected from external magnetic fields by, by the superconducting, uh, by superconducting boundary. And so the way we're going to do that is actually deposit thin film superconductor over the surface of that quartz block. And so the folks out there have been helping us uh, measure uh, superconducting uh, thin film uh, shielding uh, using a sputtering uh, system with niobium. And so uh, some initial tests that we've been doing out there have been not sputtering niobium on our final quartz block, but rather on other geometries, including tubes, just to evaluate the quality of the superconducting films prior to coating the, the, the real final sample chamber. And so in particular, uh, we've done some tests of adhesion, uh, the superconducting transition temperature, and also the uh, magnetic shielding factor for different types of thin film uh, niobium uh, coatings. So we've studied, for example, the shielding factor dependence on the thickness of the coating and shown how we can approach the theoretical value as the, as the thickness of the coating uh, gets uh, thicker, closer to one micron, which is close to our target thickness. And there's some additional tests that are currently in progress to try to study this under the conditions of higher shielding factors that are closer to what we're aiming for in the experiment, where our ultimate to get our full sensitivity, we'd ultimately like to get a shielding factor demonstrated something like around 10 to the eight, 
uh, which um, for, for solid niobium shielding factors as high as 10 to the nine have been achieved in, in experiments. So we're optimistic that, that with a sufficient uh, quality film, we should be able to get uh, exceeding 10 to the eight, which would allow us to get to the, the design sensitivity. The, the prototype uh, source mass here made of tungsten is shown in this photograph. So this is this wheel that spins around next to the sample area. So it's 3.8 centimeters across uh, made of tungsten. So we chose very high purity uh, tungsten, but nevertheless have to check for any magnetic impurities that may be processed or might be deposited through the fabrication process rather. And so we did some initial tests using a squid system uh, at Indiana where we could put some sort of bound on impurities at the level of a few, less than a part per million, uh, which already looks promising. Uh, we did some more sophisticated uh, uh, tests uh, following that uh, with our collaborators at the Metrology Institute in Germany at PTB. So here they tried to deliberately magnetize the tungsten wheel to try to bring out any, any uh, inclusions or other kind of ferromagnetic domains much, much be present. And then that was tested in their, in their squid uh, magnetometer system where they looked at the field kind of and after uh, degaussing the, the, the rotor. Uh, so the good news was that uh, after degaussing the rotor, the, the, the field near the surface was at the level of picotesla, uh, which was measured in their shielded room, uh, which is actually consistent with what we'd expect from the Johnson noise, uh, which should be tolerable if we're able to attain the superconducting shielding uh, factor that we need from the thin film uh, niobium. So we've since done some more precise uh, testing of the impurities and actually have now created sort of a map. Uh, we've been able to map out uh, the location of a few isolated inclusions or magnetic impurities in the, in the prototype rotor. So here we've spun the rotor while looking at the component which would be generated at the 11th harmonic, which would be the frequency that we're trying to drive the NMR uh, material. And so we've studied uh, the, 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 the spectrum of the magnetic field from the rotating uh, tungsten wheel and been able to identify the presence of a few discrete magnetic impurities, uh, none of which are at a level which are sufficiently uh, concerning uh, to, to limit the sensitivity of the experiment. Again, consider it, uh, in the limit that the, the shielding factor is as good as we, as we are designing it to be. So, so we're fairly confident at least that the, the specs on the, on, the, on the rotor will be sufficient to, to reach the first round uh, design sensitivity. Uh, so also we've been working on checking the stability and the uh, uh, speed stability of our, of our rotation mechanism. We've been able to demonstrate that we have we can keep the frequency of rotation of this thing constant at, at the better, at, at the frequency of interest at about a part in, part in 10,000 which would allow us to keep the sample on resonance and control the speed at a level to really utilize a high Q resonance or a high, uh, a high T2 uh, time in, in the helium. So that, that looks promising. We've also been testing some of the um, wobble and other sort of uh, um, run out of this, of this uh, stage and, and bearings assembly and so forth. And so, so we're, we're, we've so far had nice results where we were able to keep things spinning with a total run out of less than a thousandth of an inch, which should allow us in principle to get uh, within close to the design sensitive, design uh, distance, I should say rather, to target axions that are with Compton wavelength of only a couple hundred microns. Uh, so in situ, uh, we'll be able to monitor the wobble of the rotating assembly as well as the speed using uh, a, a fiber coupled laser interferometers. So we've developed a system now where we can monitor in real time the position of the spinning uh, 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 rotor as well as the, uh, we can keep track of uh, what phase it's rotating with and so forth using uh, fiber coupled interferometers that will go into the, into the cryogenic system. So that, that's looking uh, so far reasonably promising. Um, and uh, finally, the, uh, the, the magnet magnetometer that's been developing, that, that's been developed here, this is a prototype that was done a while ago but from Yang Hong Lee at Chris, where, where they did a, a squid on a quartz substrate. We're currently working on a new uh, design uh, that's for a, a lower nose uh, gradiometer design, which should, uh, in principle, allow us to get even better sensitivity and more immunity to things like vibrations in the system. So we're excited uh, to put some of these different parts together now that we've been testing 
various components and are hoping to complete the assembly of the of the of the full uh, cryostat for commissioning at sometime in the middle of of 2021. So that's kind of a snapshot of where we're currently sitting experimentally. I just wanted to, to kind of end with a little bit of a future projection of why I think this is exciting in particular, not only for the experiment itself, but also in the context of the whole field in terms of axion searches. And so if you look at, again, this allowed parameter space for the axion uh, mass going from 10 to the minus 11 up to 10 to the minus 2 uh, electron volts, when I look at all uh, these experiments that are being being developed covering various portions of this parameter space, it really is conceivable that in the next couple decades, we may be able to completely search uh, for the entire uh, axion window all over this band using the combination of these different haloscopes and other fifth force techniques like our technique, uh, which would be very exciting, I think. And in the future, even potentially taking advantage of technology which would allow us to go beyond the, the, the standard quantum limit, uh, both in terms of the uh, LC circuit uh, type resonators and uh, in the case of our um, NMR based type detectors as well, using either a spin squeezing uh, photon up converters or, or spin squeezing in, in nuclear spins. And so um, with that, I think I will go ahead and conclude. So Ariadne is a new experiment that's being developed to do a fifth four search uh, for axions using NMR. And we're hoping to fill in what has been a long-standing gap in the search for the QC axion uh, between kind of 100 micro EV to, to 10 milli EV. Our experiment is sort of unique in the context of other uh, axion searches in that we don't really need to scan over the mass in the same way that other experiments do. There's no tuning rod to tune to make sure you're resonant with the axion. We basically can scan all of the axion masses within our Compton wavelength all at the same time. And also our experiment is independent of any cosmological assumptions and, and doesn't care about the dark matter density on earth, for example. Uh, as I mentioned, we're hoping to complete the cryostat and start commissioning the experiment in the middle of this coming year. And uh, I think the really exciting thing for the field is the prospect to eventually uh, combine our, our work with the work, other work you guys are doing here, as well as the other work around the world, which would maybe make it possible to really rule out the entire, or search rather, the entire QCD axion uh, parameter space in the next uh, couple of uh, decades. And so with that, I just wanted to acknowledge our, our funding and team and the people doing the work and uh, thank everyone for your attention. Um, Andrew, thank you very much. That was an amazing uh, talk. Really, well, thanks. Absolutely marvelous. And the progress is so, so impressive. Uh, you're really exciting. Um, there is, uh, um, if you go to uh, slide 13. Mm. Thirteen. Okay, almost there. <laughs> uh, yes. Right. I mean, uh, I always say Ariadne doesn't need dark matter to be. I mean, it's independent in that sense. Everybody else in, over here requires dark matter, of course, not the solar axions. Uh, uh -huh. but, uh, it's an amazing thing that you can test the axion um, independently in the lab, and this would be, as far as I'm, uh, I can uh, um, understand or uh, I remember, the only experiment that it can produce and detect axions, um, uh, I mean QCD axions, to that uh, to the level to the required uh, level. So reality in that regard is very unique. Yes, thank you. I think that's right. I don't think there's any other currently proposed or developing experiment that can source the axion locally and detect it. So the, the, of course, the, the light shining through walls experiments are exciting, but they're the primary searches for just axion-like particles, not the QCD axion. Exactly. And one more point I want to put further down is that you have maybe three, four, five slides later than this. I'll tell you when to stop.
there. This one, this is another amazing plot. Uh, and the top, uh, I mean, this band that is where theta QCD is less than 10 to the minus 10, mm -hmm. that limit comes from the neutron EDM limit. Yes, correct. Right. Now, as you know, um, a lot of neutron EDM experiments are coming on, I mean, online with better sensitivity but also the proton electric dipole moment, which is really now coming together as a, mm. a, a mature experiment ready to go. And it's imaginable. I mean, one, one can imagine that we'll, we'll do the experiment and let's say we find it at 10 to the minus 26, 10 to the minus 27, okay? Uh -huh. And what is happening, if you can reach with the uh, Ariadne, if we can reach with Ariadne, the projected to reach, then you can completely eliminate uh, the axion hypothesis. And this is also a unique feature of Ariadne. Uh -huh. This argument, I'm saying this uh, for several years now, I think, started sinking in and people started to understand what I'm talking about. And, and nobody else could do, could say this for axioms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, there's a nice complementarity with the neutron EDM measurements here. Absolutely. Right. Great. Thank you again. I'm sure other people have questions. Okay, um, can, I, can, I, can I ask questions? A younger one. Yeah. So, uh, it was a great talk, so thank you. And I have uh, one, uh, two questions. <laughs> one is that in your, the, you describe about that the spin system has the quality factor is about omega times the coherence times T2. So it is the, in that sense, it is the sense of the number of oscill coherent oscillations. So you mentioned it is like a quality factor. Yeah, I mean, so that's sort of an enhancement factor, right? So, um, so you can think about it sort of a, as a, as a, um, yeah. So a quality factor is dimensionless, right? So, so it's a T two. I think is the experimental parameter that you really want to optimize. Yes. Um, uh, you can adjust omega, of course, by you know changing the background field, right? Yeah. But but. It, but effectively, there's some number of coherent oscillations, and so so working with a, for example, you know, if you wanted to have the spinning uh, tungsten rotor stay on resonance the entire time, it's this Q factor that's important, right? So you need to know how precise must you yeah, make yeah, the teeth yeah. pass and so forth, right? So that's why I think that's a natural thing to call to call the the Q factor, <laughs> but it's T2, I think the the challenge that's really the experimental challenge is to get the T2 as high as possible. So it, in the sense, it is the like uh, in the spectrums in the in the frequency domain, we, it is the like uh, how much the narrow bandwidth that we could achieve is the like uh, in the sense there is a, you mentioned the quality factor of the enhancement of the uh, signal to noise ratio, right? Yeah, I mean, so I guess depending on what you're what you're limited by, uh, you may choose to work at different frequencies, right? Uh, to um, uh, you, you know, to 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 uh, avoid certain systematics or, or noise sources. So, I think you don't want to be too low frequency because of one over f noise, right? So, you want to be at some reasonable frequency. So, we're targeting something like fifty or hundred hertz, right? At least to start. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean, so so I guess you can look at the the, the various noise sources for the trade offs are running at various frequencies and the what's technically challenging about each. But, but generally speaking, I think the, the hap we'll be happier with higher T2 because it gives us more uh, <laughs> sensitivity. <laughs> so, yeah. well, another question is that uh, we, we, as we know, we polarize the helium three in the room temperature and we dunk it to the low temperature. But is there, uh, how do we, and, and in the room temperature case, we polarize because of the NEOP, we can only polarize it up to like, like one terrorism. But, in the low temperature, we have at the high density of the polarized helium three. So, uh, is there any uh, idea of to uh, dunk to the from the low uh, high, uh, in the room temperature to the low temperature? 
Yeah, I mean, so as you as you as you know, right? I mean, it's it's a little bit tricky to to transport the helium, maintaining the polarization from the room temperature to the low temperature. So the the apparatus itself, you know, with the RF discharge and the laser and everything, is not really compatible with directly working cold. So we we do the we do the MIOP at room temperature. And then the idea is you could either let the gas uh, diffuse down into a, a low temperature volume. The, the challenge there is that that diffusion may take a while and you'd be subject to depolarization as you were diffusing through magnetic gradients. Uh, a better strategy that we're doing is to actually actively pump the helium from the uh, room temperature cell to the low temperature cell. And then we have these set of uh, helium-3, actually it's on the next slide, uh, helium-3 uh, tight uh, low temperature valves, which we can use to close off the, the, the sample interaction volume during the course of the measurement. So we, we have a pumping system that it's not shown here that's being developed by the Indiana team where they have a, um, a mechanism to basically drive the flow of helium from the room temperature cell down into the low temperature area. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, so I have learned today is, you know, uh, your action could do a lot of jobs. You know, I mean, as you, you, your action could just solve the you know, strong secret problem and act as, you know, uh, the force mediator. You know, it even could, could address the dark matter, you know, you know, you know mystery or stuff like that, right? I think this is amazing. Mm -hmm. But here is my uh, silly question. So uh, your action has to be QCD action to be the you know, the force mediator? Not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we could also measure an axion-like particle, right? That wasn't the QCD axion. So, okay. so that would be very interesting, I think, if we find something and then the neutron EDM experiment doesn't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there's some other particle there that's doing something else that's not related to QCD. It's not. So we're, we're just really doing a spin dependent, um, spin dependent force search essentially, right? So, so it, it may be, we, we have the sensitivity to see the QCD axion, but we could also see something else that was just an axion like particle in theory. Does so that what, answer your what, question? Yeah, or? yeah what, what, once you discover your action, and then and then how do you how do you you know verify that your your action could be could be QCD? It is actually the QCD. yeah. So I think that that's where really again this coming back to Giannis's point about the complementarity with the EDM measurements, right? So if you can really get the sensitivity good in the EDM measurement, then you could really verify that it's actually the QCD axion uh, that we found and not some other axion. Okay. So I think you have to you have to you still you still want to do the neutron EDM measurement. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Thanks. I have some questions. Can I use the super fluid helium A phase in the Ariane experiment? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. So we've thought recently about this. So super fluid helium 3, of course, has additional technical difficulties of needing to work at ultra low temperatures, right? So, so working with super fluid helium 3 is non trivial experimentally, but, but there are some advantages potentially towards using. Um, homogeneously processing domains or something like this, right, in, in, uh, in helium-3, which would allow you to potentially circumvent some of these limitations from quantum projection noise uh, limits. But, but I think, um, so it's, it's interesting to think about whether you could push the sensitivity uh, down using some collective mode, which has higher, uh, higher sensitivity. But, but the, the experimental challenge of working with such an ultra low temperature environment makes it not really probably ideal, at least for the first round of this experiment, but it's something that could be interesting to look at in the future, I think. Because I don't know the Bill Hyper in the Northwestern University, he very expert about helium three, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I've actually Bill, Bill, I've talked to Bill specifically about this idea. So, so, so it's not something we're gonna implement in Ariadne, um, I think anytime soon, but it's something that mm -hmm. We're, we're thinking about, and then we have a couple of theoretical uh, colleagues who are also uh, thinking about that as well. Thank you. Okay, go on. Do Thank you very much for uh, your great review on PCB action and area doing. So I have a question on this slide. So you are going to transfer planet three helium to uh, three samples, then. Uh, how could how can you uh, calibrate the number density of planet city helium for each sample, and how can you 
combine the signal data from the samples. Yeah, I mean, so we'll we'll have uh, we'll have an NMR coil. We can drive we can drive the samples independently to just to test to test the um, procession. But so we have independent bias field control in each in each cell, and uh, we can look for we we have an optical encoder which tells us where the position of the rotor is. And so if if it's the rotor that's actually driving the spin procession through the fictitious axion field there'll be a correlation in the procession between the different sample cells that, that's, that's predictable. And so we can look at kind of random, you know, procession that's occurring versus the driven procession by looking for the right pattern of the phase of the rotation between the different vessels. Uh, I'm not sure, was, was that, did I answer your question or? Yes, and also uh, when you drive the bias uh, field, then uh, will you use the d shared coil? Yeah, the, the D-shaped coil is used to set the bias field. To drive the sample, there's another coil I didn't show that we can apply a transverse field to drive it. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, then next, thanks, people again. Thank you very much.